Well, good afternoon. Let me thank the media once again for responding to our invitation. What I hope will be a brief press conference dealing primarily with the recent development of the um, in the United Kingdom concerning the new strain of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I have with me the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Juan Cecilia Thomas, who will go into the more technical aspect of this new development. But I'd like to use my brief um, presentation to speak to the government's decision, which would have been mentioned in the media already, that we will not be banning any flights coming out of the UK. And we anticipate that the trade between Antigua, Barbuda, and United Kingdom will continue as normal. But I think it is important to explain how we arrive at this decision. Uh, from time to time, we are faced with having to make similar decisions within a specific time or specific time frame. There is nothing static about managing COVID. When developments take place, we have to respond based on our capacity at a particular time and what are the issues involved in the process of managing COVID, the transmission. Any transmission, especially this new variant of the virus SARS-CoV-2, in our estimation, will be successfully managed by the Ministry of Health and all the other ministries involved by applying the same set of protocols and the rules governing the ports of entry in Antigua and Barbuda. And when I refer to the port of entry and the activities there, I, place, I emphasize the importance of good surveillance and the work done by our health officials at the port of entry. What we have to consider with this new um, variant, uh, uh, this new variant of the virus is whether or not we have the capacity in place where we could effectively manage uh, this new variant. And I'm confident that we do. But there is, though, something that has changed. And that is, no one really knows about this variant in its detailed form. And I will ask the Chief Medical Officer to go into some more details. Like most of the things associated with uh, SARS-CoV-2, there aren't too many conclusions about this virus, even now. What we can conclude, having had to manage this over the last nine, ten months, is that the use of masks is one of the most effective ways of uh, reducing transmission of this virus, whether it is the old variant or, or the new variant or what existed before. And I want to make the analogy, and most people in Antigua and Barbuda understand cricket. If you were to have a bowler with a ball in his hand and a batsman with a bat in his hand, that bowler can be seen as the host and the ball can be seen as the virus. He will transmit that ball to the batsman and the batsman has a bat in his hand to defend his wicket. If he doesn't have a bat in his hand, chances are he will not be able to stop the ball from hitting his wicket. The bat in his hand is like the mask we wear. And it doesn't matter whether or not it's a fast bowler 
or a spin bowler, whether he bowls fast or slow, as long as he has a bat, bat in his hand, he can defend his wicket. Similarly, if we continue to wear our mask and wear them properly, whether this it is this variant or any other form of the uh, virus, we are more than likely to be successful in reducing the transmission of the virus. And if nothing else, from this press conference, the Ministry of Health, all the officials are of the firm view that our success or failure has to do with the proper and consistent use of masks. We must continue to wear our masks. Now, we also will emphasize on the enforcement of the protocols. That is easily the greatest challenge we have, the enforcement. Even though we are responsible to manage COVID, the actual enforcement is the responsibility of the law enforcement agency, the police. And we have to rely on the police to make sure that those who would wish to depart from the regulations of COVID are reminded of the consequences and some of these consequences, especially in business places, might very well be closure of these business places if they continue uh, to breach the protocols. I am very, very, very concerned as the minister that going into this Christmas season, there is evidence of people already uh, being um, uh, wantonly defiant of the regulations in place as well as the protocols that have proven to be so effective. And so I would just wish to encourage the business places, especially the bars and the restaurants, the meeting places where large crowds gather, that they have a responsibility to follow the regulations and the protocols established. Having said that, the Chief Medical Officer has done an in-depth analysis of this new variant and would wish to share some important information to the public. So I pass it over to the Chief Medical Officer. Thank you, Minister Joseph, and good morning to everyone. Uh, good morning to members of the media, general public. On 14 December 2020, authorities in the United Kingdom reported that a SARS-CoV-2 variant had been identified through viral genomic sequencing in about 1,100 individuals, and that was of 13 December 2020. Uh, given that this new variant could have been dated back as far back as September 2020, it is likely that the virus is also circulating elsewhere. Uh, the reported COVID-19 cases related to the variant are concentrated in Kent and wider Southeast England, including regions of London and the East of England. There will be more widespread occurrence and we've known since the 13th of December that there has been, in, there has been in fact been widespread in, um, distribution of the new variant. It has been reported um, over some media, via the media, that the new variant is more transmissible than other variants. I was in a, a weekly briefing that with the World Health Organization just this morning, early this morning, and there it was emphasized that it has not yet been proven that that is in fact so. But because of the nature of COVID-19, they're being very cautious and they are treating the virus, this new variant, as if it is more very, um, transmissible. But that has not been confirmed as yet. We need to note that 
all viruses, including SARS-CoV-2, change over, t over time. And so far, there have been hundreds of variations of this virus identified worldwide, and PAHO WHO have been following them closely. In, Anti in the Caribbean region, in a meeting um, with CAFA just this week, they, the Caribbean Public Health Agency, in association or in collaborating with the University of the West Indies, they will be doing sequences of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that would have been circulating in, a, in the region, including Antigua and Barbuda. So in a few days, we'll be able to know what variant has been circulating in Antigua and in the region, and whether or not the variant that they have identified so far has been in Antigua and Barbuda. And certainly, we'll be bringing the, that information to the public. Now, I had mentioned before that the RNA viruses, such as SARS-CoV-2, they change over time. It's a characteristic of RNA viruses. But so far, with SARS-CoV, most of the changes have had little or no impact on how it transmits or the severity of disease it causes. I said before, it has not confirmed yet that it's more transmissible, but they have noted that there have been no reports of poor clinical in outcomes with the new variant, no higher mortality, and what that means is that they have not noticed that persons with this variant are dying more frequently than other persons with COVID-19, and no specific population group would have been affected. So it apparently affects all populations um, equally. To date, a few cases of the variant have been detected outside the UK, and as I said, we will know in a few days whether or not it's circulated in the region and in Antigua and Barbuda. We do receive flights from the United Kingdom. So of course, in the Ministry of Health, we are concerned that um, the possibility exists that this variant can be introduced into Antigua and Barbuda, if not here before. Uh, there are several things that we can do to mitigate the effects of that mutant, um, that variant be, uh, having an impact in Antigua and Barbuda. We, of course, have to be very vigilant. As Minister Joseph would have mentioned, we have uh, what we've been doing at our ports of entry have been working. The latest dashboard would have indicated that we've had a decrease in the number of active cases. We continue to do testing and we, um, our numbers continue to remain in the single digits, which is very, very good. But in order for us to maintain that, we have to be vigilant at our ports of entry. We also have to rely on the public to comply with the protocols and measures and guidelines that the ministry would have put in place. The minister spoke of the use of masks. We know it has been proven that masks help to protect the spread or prevent the spread of COVID-19. And we want to reinforce to the members of the population that they need to wear their mask correctly, covering the nose and the mouth, and to wear the mask at all times, when they, especially when they're interacting with other persons. Physical distancing, maintaining at least six feet between persons. Social distancing, not going to parties, limiting um, going to functions, receptions, where um, those um, occasions where you would have to interact more with persons and possibly increase your risk of developing COVID-19. Persons are asked to please, 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 especially over the Christmas, over the holiday season, to remember those guidelines and protocols and to abide by them. Quarantine. Persons are asked to obey the quarantine orders of the quarantine authority. It's still that they um, or the recommendation in Antigua and Barbuda, 14 days of quarantine. That has not changed. Um, we have in instances where persons are reporting that the Centers for Disease Control has reduced the quarantine period. That is not true. If you read the CDC's um, website very carefully, they still recommend 14 days of quarantine and surveillance. In special circumstances, they're saying, and it depends on local authorities, they can change um, or modify the 14-day period. That is not the case in Antigua and Barbuda for everyone. And additionally, um, through the Caribbean Public Health Agency, just to reinforce that point, they did organize a session with chief medical officers of the region with CDC where that was fully explained that quarantine recommended is still 14 days by the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control. So the members of the public, if you are aware of persons who would have come into Antigua and Barbuda and you know they're not supposed to be up and about, please report it to the Ministry of Health, report to the police. 
because they are putting you as a citizen of Antigua and Barbuda, as a resident here, at risk. Um, the minister also mentioned we need the assistance of the police. Um, I making a plea to the police. They've been working with the Ministry of Health in the past to continue to work with us as we try to uh, enforce the protocols and guidelines that we have in place, the wearing of the face mask, the limiting of social gatherings, and of course, quarantine. Uh, Minister mentioned as well that there would be no travel ban in the United Kingdom, and as a result, we will be looking to uh, increase our vigilance at our ANC ports with regard to persons coming either directly from the United Kingdom or indirectly because they may come through um, via another, um, another um, city. We will be increasing our vigilance and we will be working to uh, make sure that persons remain in quarantine and abide by the rules and guidelines. Thank you. Well, the, from uh, my discussions with WHO and PAHO, so far they have not um, noted that it would affect the new, that, that, that it would affect the efficacy of the vaccines currently in use. I mean, the ones that are still in clinical trials, they're still in cl clinical trials, and we uh, await data and information as to whether or not those um, vaccines would be affected by this new variant, but so far, no. Well, if you look at um, just the data that we have, you see that most of our cases, the majority of cases, are imported cases. So of the 153 cases we have, about to confirm cases we have so far, 90 would have been imported and 63 would have been non-imported. So there you see that um, the numbers are going up more because of the imported cases. Um, in terms of transmission in country, uh, most of the cases that we've, we've seen um, have been linked to imported cases. Um, so, for example, we would have clusters, even when we have a cluster of local cases, uh, in many instances we can link that cluster to an, an imported case. So I, I think um, imported cases, you know, do have a, a significant impact on the numbers in Antigua and Barbuda. I think we all have to be responsible in terms of COVID-19 and um, I wouldn't want to put the blame on anyone. We all have a responsibility to stick to the protocols, follow the guidelines, wear our masks pr um, properly. For example, if you have a, a, a tourist coming in and you're interacting with that person or if you have a, non -na a, a national coming in, you still have to wear your mask. You still have to maintain your social and physical distancing. It doesn't matter if the person is a, a returning national or tourist, they're coming from a place outside of Antigua and Barbuda, and you have to maintain your protocols and guidelines and your physical and social distancing to protect yourself. Let me just a brief comment on that because this has been a lingering issue in the community where they're saying that the government is blaming returning nationals. I recall at the beginning um, when we reopened our borders, as a matter of fact, just before we closed our borders, we allowed a, a JetBlue flight 
to come in. And on that flight were several Antiguans. And we had uh, then several of them who brought COVID to Antigua. The CMO is correct. We need not um, begin to put labels on whether or not it's Antiguans or their visitors. To me, that's not the issue. The issue so far as the nationals are concerned is that when they return and they have the disease, they go into the community and they are more likely to spread that disease within the villages. And you're from the village, you know what happens when a family member comes home. He goes to look for cousins and everybody goes to the shops. It's not the same with a visitor. The visitor is likely to spend most of the time at the hotel, as should, based on the, the, the rules that we have put into the hotel. And at the same time, the hotel workers are trained to protect themselves where they wear their mask. Now, you don't, you're unlikely to see people coming from New York, and let me make it directly from my experience. They come into New York, they come to Jennings, they're not wearing masks. You go through Jennings, the villagers are not wearing masks. So it is where you have the highest risk. That is the issue. And now let us get sidetracked whether or not it's an Antiguan or a visitor. The issue is, and, and let me give you an example. Look at what has happened in Grenada. Twice, there were 13 in one family who contracted the disease and another family 11. How do you think that happened? That didn't happen at the hotel. That virus went into the community. And families, cousins, uncles, granny, everybody socializing. And that is our biggest fear right now. We have 900 people plus in quarantine. And most of them are coming for uh, Christmas vacation. And we want to send a message that they have to be responsible. And they cannot, within the 14-day quarantine, be having parties and going all over the village. If, we, if that happens, we are likely to see an increase in the number of active cases in Antigua and Barbuda. This is my biggest concern. These are the, the 900 is the highest number of people we've had in quarantine. Prior to the Christmas season, it was like 150. 200, that's manageable. We can put them in a hotel and we can monitor, monitor them, or even with the, um, the, the bracelets that we brought in. But we, don't, we only have 200 bracelets, and we have 900 people in quarantine. And this, this press conference is really to, to try to get the people of Antigua and Barbuda the, the, the importance of their role in exercising discipline and following the protocols, as we're going to lose it. It would be a shame after nine, ten months of managing this COVID to right now we have maybe three or four cases that we lose it simply because people are not willing to display some discipline or practice some discipline at this time during Christmas. That is really the main concern. Yes, I, I think that um, that team has been put together. They're now operating from um, the ministry headquarters in a conference room, and this is in connection with the, um, the surveillance work with the bracelet and using the police to assist in uh, intervening when the uh, regulations are breached. Uh, so that is in place. Well, I think the same way you can give an update on the bracelets. I know that um, they, uh, 
what the command center is in place and I am not sure whether or not they have rolled out the actual um, use of the bracelets at this time. Yes, um, you know anything that uh, relates to quarantine right now is regulated or um, in accordance with the Quarantine Act and um, the, although the public health regulations would have been amended to m accommodate the use of the bracelets, the quarantine directions and quarantine instructions, they have n were not amended and uh, legal affairs, they're actually working on that as we speak and once the necessary forms and amendments have been made to the regulations of the quarantine regulations and directions and would have been gazetted, then we would look at implementation. But it can't be done until that is, it can't be implemented until that is done. Implementation can't continue until that's done. Yes, I can give you an update on that. I have the meeting with um, uh, Mr. Jeffers, who is going to be the gentleman that is uh, responsible for the management. I'm meeting this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, he has given me an estimate of about seven days. He believes that he can have everything in place and have the quarantine facility, the uh, Jolly Beach Hotel Commission. So uh, this afternoon I'll have a better idea exactly when that will be done. In the meantime, we're using um, Halcyon uh, Hotel, um, but ideally we would wish to have um, uh, Jolly Beach because we can quarantine a, a minimum of 350 uh, people in Jolly Beach and even more. And that will give us a higher level of, uh, of security in controlling the people um, because our biggest problem is people who leave quarantine and go roaming around in the communities. No update and um, uh, we have to maintain um, that for the time being. Uh, there are some developments which suggest that our decision is the correct one from some information um, uh, that's coming to me now. And uh, uh, I think that um, uh, the ban was until when? The sometime next year? I didn't see a, a, a Yeah, there, there is a timeline. Um, and it is, it is of concern to us. That is a hot spot. And um, if you know a hot spot, and we have had experience in the past, in back in June, I think, when we had 29 positive cases, mm -hmm. uh, when we made a decision that really was against the uh, better judgment, frankly, of the Ministry of, of, of Health, and uh, we got 29 positive cases on, in one trip, um, and we don't intend for that to happen again. This is not a matter of not having sensitivity for the people of uh, Santo Domingo. As a matter of fact, uh, many of them are citizens. But we have to balance these things. And first and foremost, we have to protect the people of Antigua and Barbuda. And uh, sometimes it is necessary to take these measures to protect the health of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to make a comment about um, not really only the Dominican Republic. Um, as Minister mentioned, it has been identified as a hotspot here in our region for COVID. And I want to urge members of the public to uh, try to limit their travel to the Dominican Republic, especially for non-essential purposes, because we have seen persons, um, we have incidents of persons coming from leaving Antigua going to the Dominican Republic and other places that are hot spots for, for example, elective procedures, procedures that medical procedures that are not an emergency. And um, I don't think now is the time you, you'd want, really want to be in a hospital setting for a non-urgent uh, matter. And then you come back with the possibility of, in, with COVID, you, you would have had a medical procedure, so you could develop COVID and 
post up that's not something that you would want and then also possibility of you transmitting COVID if you develop it to another to other persons so um, I want to just put that plug in that we have seen persons coming um, nationals going to the Dominican Republic and other hot spots for surgery and then coming back to Antigua if it's non urgent I would recommend that persons defer such um, plans Thanks. What's the difference? I don't. The this, this same to me. So I did say the Dominican Republic and other hotspots to include those areas that you mentioned. I did say that. That be a. We can basically use the statistics. Um, we've been. Our borders has been open since June. And the rate of infection coming out of the United States and the United Kingdom is far less than the rate of infection coming out of the Dominican Republic. And, uh, and when you look at our data of the number of infections, uh, for instance, I think we're about 153. Yes. Um, over 30 of those, and I'm being conservative, coming out of the Dominican Republic. And, and look at their population compared to the United States and the United Kingdom. So these statistical um, uh, nuances uh, must also be taken into consideration in making these decisions. And um, we, we do not, as, as I want to uh, say again, it's not discriminatory. It is a practical decision to protect the people of Antigua and Barbuda, including, including citizens from the Dominican Republic who live here. We have to protect them too. How close to the as to Yeah, I'd let the, the CMO answer that because CMO is the one that has been following up. But um, the CMO is quite diplomatic when she referred to non-elective surgery. But sometimes, you know, as a politician, um, uh, sometimes you need to go beyond diplomacy. The people who are going down for cosmetic surgery to Dominican Republic, they should be encouraged to defer those type of surgeries and we have had cases where some decisions are made and it's not even in the best interest of the patients themselves so please we uh, appreciate that there is that need but uh, doing that in the time of COVID is to me not the best uh, decision uh, I can make decisions for people um, but the point is that when they return, they have to go into quarantine when they have had these surgeries. And why would somebody want to have a surgery coming back to Antigua and be placed in a quarantine? And so, um, as I said, the CMO is quite diplomatic and talk about non-elective surgery, as the most of it is cosmetic. Uh, so I thought I said... Yes. Thanks for that compliment. <laughs> um, the question about the vaccines? Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, just this morning, as I said, I, I was in a, on a call with WHO. It looks like uh, countries like Antigua and Barbuda would have access to the vaccines by March, late March, early April of 2021. Uh, WHO, they are conducting their own analysis of the current vaccines that are available, uh, that are in use now in some countries and even those that are still in clinical trial phase. So they have assured us that by the end of March, early April. In the meantime, we are making preparations in Antigua and Barbuda for, um, we do know that the Moderna and the Pfizer, 
they require some extreme um, required they have ex extreme requirements for storage in terms of temperature control and in Antigua we're making arrangements for that in the event that we do get those um, either one of those two vaccines but just to note that there are other vaccines such as the one um, produced by AstraZeneca that uh, needs to be stored between two and eight degrees and that's something that we're more familiar with because that's where we how we store our vaccines right now and the, the other vaccines such as um, one by Johnson & Johnson that is in a clinical um, trial as, as well that looks quite favorable and that as well is um, being to be stored at a normal temperature. And when I say normal, I mean two to eight. And yes, Minister, the other thing is that um, some of the vaccines that are candidates are not in use yet but look quite favorable. They're single dose. So right now we have prepared for 20,000 doses. The Pfizer and the Moderna, they require two doses. So it means that only 10,000 persons will be able to be um, vaccinated. If we were to get a single dose vaccine, then we'd be able to vaccinate 20,000 persons, which would be more favorable for Antigua and Barbuda. So um, those are issues that we're looking at. And um, I don't know if Minister wants to say anything else about our process for the selecting the vaccine and well um, not so much to add um, CMO because um, we are very much in step with uh, the COVAX requirement and to say that um, no later than about the 15th of uh, January we hope to have the storage facility in place with, with um, to give us the flexibility in terms of temperature. Uh, that is well advanced and uh, by mid-January we should have it in place, which is important. The other important thing is though that we are putting a permanent storage facility in place. Uh, so we would not have to be uh, looking at um, uh, storing vaccine all over Antigua and Barbuda. That will become the single place where all vaccines are stored, so it will be centralized which is better for management, better for security, and, and, and so forth. But let us not get ahead of ourselves. Between now and when vaccine arrives, the, the key thing is for us to continue to wear our mask and practice social distancing and so on. It's going to be a while before we get out of that. And um, we must just fix our minds that for the next 30, 45 days that we must continue to do the things that have worked and that is the social distancing, the wearing of masks, the hygiene uh, and let me commend the, um, the business places especially the banks and supermarkets when you go they have hand washing facilities and some of the uh, bars uh, not the bars so much because I don't know about the bars I don't go to the bars but I know the, the CBH has helped the here dressing salons and so on and barbershops uh, to put in their facilities. Antigua as a country has done extremely well in putting those things in place. And I suspect that's one of the reasons why we are, can continue to see single digit, um, what you call, active cases. Now, if people begin to put in their minds that a vaccine is coming and therefore they don't need to continue to be the discipline and to be vigilant, then that would be a mistake. We need to encourage our people to sustain the discipline that um, they have exhibited over the last uh, nine, ten months uh, for a few more months. And I think that uh, we'll see good results and be able to uh, transition well into the period of vaccines. I mean, yes, and it and construction has started. Yes. I'm amazed that we still get this question. Why is it with people coming from 
with a negative PCR can have to be quarantined. I let the CMO um, add her piece, but we have said over and over again, a negative PCR is a test in a particular time. There is no way to predict after you have had that negative PCR whether or not the virus, the presence of the virus will manifest itself by some illness like fever and so forth. And our experience, CMO, is that we've had many instances where people come with negative, negative PCR, you put them in quarantine, and then they come down with COVID. So you can help with that. So, um, for me, everybody would it, it quarantine, observation, surveillance, whatever you want to call it. You come in as a national, as a tourist, as a non-national, you have to be monitored, you have to, even if it's self-monitoring for signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Because you can have a test for COVID-19 today. It's negative. You go outside, you meet somebody, you interact with somebody, and you develop the disease. That test that you would have taken would have been negative, but you would have been exposed to the virus. And 10 days down the line, although you have a, or seven days down the line, when you still have that negative test, you have COVID. The nature of COVID is that we don't know, you don't know when you would have, you would have picked it up. I use the analogy, I use uh, HIV. You can have an HIV test and you're negative because we know there's certain, only certain situations where the virus, that virus can be transmitted and you protect yourself. You can be fairly confident that you would not be HIV positive. But with COVID, you don't know. As I said before, you have a negative test today and you go and interact with someone. You go on an airplane. You sit next to someone. You don't know that if that person has the disease, has the virus. You can become infected, come to Antigua, and guess what? You still have a negative test, but you're harboring the virus in your system. And then day 10 of your quarantine, you show signs and symptoms of the disease. The guidelines and, and the information from WHO, the incubation period could be from five to seven, 10 days. And they recommend 14 days where we observe persons, we monitor them to make sure that they, if they develop signs and symptoms of the disease, fever, cough, shortness of breath, loss of smell, loss of taste, lethargy, weakness, diarrhea, that we're able to isolate them quickly. Imagine someone coming in with a negative test and they think that they're okay, but they would have been exposed after that test and they go home to their family and start developing or they go out to a party and they are harboring the, the, the virus and within that 14 day period they develop signs and symptoms they would have been infected so many people experience and that has happened in Antigua and Barbuda people come in with a negative test think that they're okay they go to a funeral they go to the, a wedding and contact tracing would reveal a number of persons who would have been infected. So a negative COVID test is not a get out of quarantine card. For me, yes. And um, Minister of Tourism would have said it's a biosecure environment and they're, supposed, they're still supposed to wear their masks. They're still supposed to practice social and physical distancing. Um, they're not to be in parties. They're not to interact as um, a lot with the members of the general population. Mostly we hope only with hotel staff who should be practicing the, um, the, the, what we put in place in terms of wearing the, the mask and um, social distancing and physical distancing. I want to re-emphasize to the public right now. I know it's Christmas. We have a lot of people returning home and temptation would be, say somebody coming into Antigua from the UK, from the United States today, for them to go home and have Christmas dinner and interact with their family. It's a risk. It is a risk to you, 
that that person, although they would come in with a negative COVID test, they can be harboring the virus and transmit that virus to you later on. So I urge persons to maintain the 14 days where persons monitor their symptoms and if they become ill, isolate themselves and report either to the Mount St. John, the healthcare provider, or call the hotline to say that they develop symptoms. It's very, very important. I'm concerned that in January you're going to see a spike in cases in Antigua and Barbuda because of persons coming in. Not only for persons coming in, but because of the nature of the season when people want to naturally interact with one another. And I have to say, COVID has um, forced us to do things that we're not accustomed to, that's unnatural. So I understand persons not wanting to wear their masks, to them wanting to interact socially, because it's what we do. And it really takes a lot of effort for persons not to hug their grandmother or hug their child when they come in immediately. But I, it's in their best interest to do so for 14 days, limit that interaction until we... Um, know that that person is not going to develop any signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Okay. For me, they should not leave. The, um, this is an issue that I think we're going to have to leave it for a while. Um, but let me give you an illustration of uh, something that happened the last weekend. Gentleman came in. Uh, he had his PCR test. The health officials uh, would have um, asked him some questions, got information, and then he was told he had to go into a quarantine. And he protested uh, vehemently to the point where he got my telephone number and called me. And. Um, I spoke to a member of his family, not him directly. And then he revealed that uh, the member of the family said that he came in and he was going to be here for seven days. But he came in to spend some time with the, with the mother, who is 90 years old. I will pause there. He came in with a negative test for seven days to see his mother a 90 years old. What would have happened if the health officials were not cautious and follow the protocol and said, okay, you could go be with your grandmother and in a few days he comes down with um, the disease. We start having temperature coughing and he has the virus spreading all over the place. These are the things that we have to consider because they are real. And this idea that um, you equate a returning national who is going to go into one of the villages, I stop saying communities, one of the villages, all saints, Jennings, Willie Keys, Coming from New York with a COVID test, and that person is all over the place. That is far different from a visitor who goes to a hotel, the hotel workers and the taxi men all interact with him, are trained with their mask and they train how to sanitize their buses. The, uh, the uh, waiters, they're supposed to be wearing masks. They're supposed to be en enforcing social, uh, 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 physical distancing at the hotels. And if there is an excursion, the taxi man knows his distance. All these things are in place. Please, you can't equate that type of operation with someone who comes from New York and say, well, I'm going into quarantine. But I think since I have a COVID, uh, negative COVID test, I have the right to go and visit my family. That is disaster. And it's because we have enforced those um, protocols and those regulations, why I believe that we are able to hold our numbers down to single digits.
the vaccine on the horizon, are uh, there no talks about how we return to the horizon? What, what, what that will look like, uh, given that we are a small population, uh, so we get to a sort of critical mass uh, to its current rate. So, yeah, is there like a, are there considerations now uh, as to how we will look for antibiotics to return to the normal as we have last you want to try that one? <laughs> I, Mr. Joseph, I don't think that you can find another person in Antigua and Barbuda who would want us to return to normalcy more than me. I do. I really, 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 really do. Um, the discussions I've had with Power and W through the vaccine, um, we're still, in, we're still looking at it, at it, you know, because they're still looking to see how persons who have been vaccinated respond. So, for example, we do know that the vaccine allows, reduces the uh, possibility that you'll go on to develop the disease. But in terms of transmission, they're not sure yet if it limits transmission. So to say that if you, have a, if you get vaccinated, um, whether or not you'll be able to, be able to stop wearing masks, it's too early to say. So, uh, I mean, I think what we do know that the vaccine will help reduce morbidity and mortality, reduce the amount of illness and the amount of deaths. But in terms of going back to normal, it's very, very, very difficult for them to say right now. But I would certainly want to see us going back to normal, not wearing masks. Um, one thing I, I, I don't want us to stop doing, I want us to continue washing our hands. That's very, very important. That's something that we should have been doing from before. Some of the public health measures that we have had to put in place with COVID are things that we should have been doing long ago. So washing your hands, cough and sneeze etiquette. And I mean, you know, when you have to cough or sneeze, use a disposable tissue and dispose of it properly when you're finished and wash your hands. Even the physical distancing the hugging, and those are things that we need to look at going forward. Is it really necessary for me to hug this person? Those are things we need to look at. The Japanese culture, they don't hug, they bow, and that's, there's a reason for that. So I don't think we'll ever get back to the normal that we know we, um, we are accustomed to. There's some things that I think we really need to continue to do, but certainly things like the wearing of the mask and other things, going to church um, in greater numbers, school, is something that I really want um, to see go back to normal. Um, some of the children, I think, have a challenge with distance learning, for example, learning over the internet. So things like that, I really want to see go back to normal. But some things like hand washing, I really hope we're able to continue. Well, let me, let me just say that. I think it's likely that we'll have a new normal. Uh, there are certain things, and I think. Um, will probably continue. Uh, I think the wearing of masks, for instance, uh, will see more frequent use of the mask, not um, for a prolonged period, but I think people are going to be more mindful of the use of masks. Like in South Korea, the last time I visited South Korea, I saw a lot of South Koreans were, were wearing masks. And, and um, there was no SARS um, virus at the time, um, but they felt it was a healthy thing to do. I think some Antigans might adopt that. Uh, for instance, hand washing. I wouldn't want to see hand washing go away. Um, at the supermarkets, at the banks, I would want to see that continue. Um, uh, we live, we, our, our lifestyle has changed. When you come into a city, the, the places you go, the things you do, and the things you hold, like rails and, and so forth, you pick up these um, viruses. And so it doesn't do any harm for us to continue those practices. There's nothing wrong with washing hands and the use sanitizers. So I expect a new normal, which, is, which could be a positive thing, not the stressful um, environment which um, many of us go through now and we're hoping to see an easing of the stress as we get closer to the time when we get a vaccine <laughs> so so thank you all very much
and um, wish you a safe, healthy Christmas and a prosperous new year, a year, new year with less COVID. So thank you.